basic question creates those first building or the Lego part? No, so in our case, we I mean at Editorji we have uh, like nearly a hundred trained journalists so putting it together. So we're doing 150 video stories a day and uh, sending it from wires, from other content, from you know agencies, looking at what's happening on the internet. So we have, uh, I mean, that's something which has to be done by human decision. So essentially, again, it comes in where the, the uh,
uh, and we would be deleting everything, everywhere where it is done. Um, and I will ensure that, uh, now that you mentioned it to me, I want to make sure that it's also deleted to any backups that there are. So, yeah, I think I completely agree with everything you said. Mr. Thank you very much. No, I need one more. Um, a question not only in India but also in other countries. Who controls the media? The government? The person who owns the, the media thing? I mean, is it an independent media? I don't think so. Look, the honest truth of the matter is that control, yes, of course. I mean, look, the media has for at least in India, has not necessarily been controlled through most of its history. We've been very fortunate in that. Um, yes, there used to be different, there used to be a time when the print used to be completely free and television was controlled, it was only Dudashan, that was the case when I started off in broadcast journalism. Then broadcast TV came and got the ability to go out and, and, and say eventually everything. Um, I think we've been very proud of the fact that for most of the history of the media, at least in my career, media has been free. There have been times when there are certain corporate houses which have any clear-cut agendas, but you've always known who those people were. It's been fairly clearly advertised. That's not been the norm. Um, is the norm changing today? Um, yes, I, I think it would be fair to say the norm is changing. I think there's a, a fairly extensive, uh, you know, large amount of corporate uh, ownership and influence which there is. It is becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to say what you really want without you know, being dragged away into a dungeon somewhere. I can't exaggerate it. You know, the fact is, it's become very easy now for pressures to be brought on bear on media organizations and on individual journalists. Um, the central government doesn't like what you are saying, what your organization is saying. You always have the ED and the CBI and various other, other departments. If a state government doesn't like what you are saying, then there's the state police and the state authorities and the local CID and that. If a district magistrate doesn't like what, what you are saying, the district magistrate can have you picked up and you know, put away. If industrialists don't like what you are saying, they can file defamation suits against you and have you lingering in court forever. Um, it's not a particularly pleasant situation. I mean, there's a reason why India has suddenly slipped to being 150 uh, out of 180 in the press freedom index. It's, 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 and it's not something that we should be happy about. Uh, it's something that we have to figure out how, how, how to reverse. Um, I don't know. I think, I think these are challenging times and I don't see an immediate solution to where this is going to turn around. Because you know, you need, you need the protection and frankly, I think the only people who can step in and play a very powerful role in this are eventually the courts. Because the very nature of journalism uh, is supposed to be to speak truth to power. Your basic job as a journalist is supposed to be to look at somebody who's really powerful. Central government, state government, local policeman, district magistrate, whoever. And you're supposed to be asking that person tough questions and you're supposed to be, that's what journal, otherwise it's PR, right? India is doing is PR. A powerful industrialist in why you being XYZ. Now by definition, the journalist is therefore constantly up against somebody who's powerful. And the only way the journalist can continue to perform his or her job is to get protection against that powerful person coming in coming after you in reprisal. And historically, the state will always like to shut journalists up. And some states don't, but states may always be tempted to do it. But in India, the courts have always played a very profound and very major role in, in making sure that journalists are free to do what they want. It's no longer today quite as easy as, as that. Judgments are different. Uh, Justice Chandra Chud in the Supreme Court, for example, has sometimes stepped out in protection of journalists. Justice Chandra Chud had a very powerful 
judgment at the Ahmed Goswami case where he said you can't just be using criminal law to terrorize journalists and reporters. But that same principle is not always applied for others. We know of other journalists who have been locked up now for years altogether. We know media organizations that are facing pressure from agencies and a whole bunch of other things. And I don't think that's that's going to change very fast. So. You yourself are very powerful. But each one of us, each one of us. I wish I were, but I think I'm powerful. You are. Um, each one of us individuals sitting here who use our voice in tweet or whatever you call it, if we may have an opinion which is against the government in particular, we are in danger of being put into jail ourselves. Yes. Well. So, so if an individual is in that kind of danger, huh? that's called control. No. So I, okay, I, I think. Am I in a hundred percent agreement with your raising? This is a very major issue which we are facing today. Yes, we are, and I think we should recognize that this is very much the reality of the situation, and I think it's a reality which is being played out across the country. It's not, I don't think, I don't think anybody's hands are clean in this. The ability to use state power against the individual is something that is happening across governments, central, state, district, across political parties. I don't think some parties are worse than others at doing it, but I think across the board it is happening. And I believe it is a very major substantive questioning of our rights and liberties as free citizens of a free country, where this is going to have to be questioned or challenged at some point. I don't know where it's going to be questioned and challenged, but it should be questioned and challenged. Because at the end of the day, the ability to speak is a fundamental right. But as you said, in Maharashtra, people who are speaking against the then government have been arrested and locked up for tweets that people didn't like. It's happened in the North East, it's happened in the central government, it happens in um, I haven't seen that many cases in Goa actually come to think of it. So <laughs> maybe it's a, but maybe, maybe, maybe there are, I mean I just said I haven't heard about them, but it's possible it happens. So yes, you know, so therefore, I believe this is a... have unsolved murder of an activist. Yeah, so you know, individuals, so there are cases. the whole point of being a free country, it's an ideological position to have. The whole point of being a free country is that a citizen or an individual should have protection against state power. Because the state already has a lot of power. Individuals do not have power. They are joined the same areas. An individual does not have power. The state has power. Mm -hmm. The definition of a free country, according to me, is a country where an individual has protection against state power. Exactly. Now, where is that protection going to come from? Historically, what are the what are the levers of power in any country? You have the executive, that's state power. You have the legislature, fine. It should be protecting you by passing laws that protect the citizen. It doesn't always happen. You have the media. Now, the media in India today, unfortunately, is no longer an institution that is protecting the citizens. It is, if anything, quite often speaking, in favor of state power. Which is not right. It depends. It depends on who the state is, which is the will of oppressing. So X media will say, Are ye kar hai, hai, wo kar hai, hai. The other, and if the, if the political party which is doing it is flipped, then that same media will say, ye kar hai, ye say ye. You know, So that becomes a question of political affiliation or anything else. The media is therefore not necessarily always protecting people. Uh, people there. It then comes down to the judiciary, right? And we have had the judiciary also to some extent displaying a certain amount of, uh, there was a very powerful three-judge bench of the Supreme Court which, which wrote uh, on bail right now very recently. There was a very powerful judgment that came talking about the rights of the individual. Two weeks later, another three-judge bench of the Supreme Court ratifies certain laws that will pretty much, can enable anyone to be holed up and locked up with the presumption of innocence is reversed. Uh, and you could be locked up and denied bail for virtually forever. So it's not crystal clear whether your rights as an individual will be protected or not. 
And that is, I think, a certainty that has to come. So does this channel help? Do you have revenue model? Revenue model is, a, is a, almost the insisting question. I wish that you would get revenues from doing things that are right as opposed to do things that are traffic, driving traffic. But it's happening. I think increasingly, a large number of brands in the country uh, and others are starting to recognize that if what you're having on television is tabloid or sensation or God forbid hate speech, which I think a lot of it is, uh, now you've got your brand which is out there connected to that. Is that necessarily good for your brand? I don't know, I'm not entirely sure that it is. So if it's not good for your brand, then why are you putting your money behind it? So I think there is, a, there is going to be a movement of brands and corporates and others to say, there is move a little bit away from, um, let, let's move a little bit away from just saying, okay, the maximum TRPs are here, the maximum, you know, that pipeline issue that I was saying, move away from the pipelines. Let's find new ways of creating content. Let's find new ways of disseminating the content. And you don't therefore need to be dependent on somebody's pipeline, especially if that pipeline most of its time is used for carrying sewage. Just and, and by the way, you know, sorry, if I can just finish the point. It's starting to happen, right? Like in January this year, we did a major, we got a pretty large digital deal with Microsoft. A big company came, they said, can you do high quality content for us? We said yes. They said, where will you show it? I said, aha, and you're prepared to listen to distributed distribution? And they said, it's a crazy concept, but we are Microsoft and we are a technology company, so we should listen to crazy concepts. And they did. So we have, that's how these things start to work, right? Because then we got into a back-to-back -back arrangement with Twitter, so it was a joint consortium approach. We created great, great content, we put it out partly on Editor G, but largely on Twitter. And every one of those videos suddenly got 300,000 video views. So it was high quality content being shown to the right people and people were watching it and we were bypassing the pipelines. The ones with sewage. And you get the revenue from the company? From the company. Yeah. The company said, fine, this is a great way to do it. We have control over it. You can directly pipe that content. You can directly provide that content to people only. But it will take time. So what happened now? A fascinating explanation of uh, why things are going wrong, uh, mostly from the technology and the economics point of view. Uh, we don't know how much it will hold in the next five years because suddenly, suddenly some Samit Jain comes along and changes the full media model and 35, 40 years later we are still reeling from it after half the country has copied that uh, same model that he has followed and today we realize how wrong it is. Uh, that's the first point. The second uh, provocation is, uh, you know, all the things you explained, I think the problem goes back far worse and forgive me for saying this but uh, Delhi covers the rest of India. I don't want to use that much abuse term, Luton's term, because you have a new Luton allied day, elite there. But Delhi covers the rest of India as if it's that small two kilometers of, of the country. You're trying to cover such a diverse country without any, without any diversity of, in your coverage. I'm not, I'm not saying you, but I mean everyone. And, and if you've not heard of cases of media abuse from Goa, it's because of this perspective. If, if there is a Fugat case, if there is a scar scarlet killing, at once Delhi's ears will go up and they'll report on it. But if there are more serious things happening, someone, report, someone uh, reports that the chief minister of the state is suffering from uh, pancreatic cancer and he loses his uh, press accreditation and gets action taken against him in the secretariat and things like that. But these are stories that the rest of the country doesn't hear. So, so what is our media doing? That's the point. Okay. It's much wider. Yes. I am. Now, I think, I think that's a fascinating point that you have just made. And now let's think of why, what I was just outlining, so sort of a platform approach or a distributed approach, a peer-to-peer -peer network approach, potentially answers exactly what you have said. Why? Why should people in Goa be dependent on daily-driven media news channels? Why? Why should that happen? Because of size. Okay. That's what they keep telling you, right? Because they are telling you, we have the size of the pipeline. They are telling you that they control the pipeline to their users. That's why they say size. That's why they think they have influence and power. Now let's flip that. Let us say that there is any person in Goa who wishes to do this. 
who can do three or four or five video stories out of Goa every week. Let's take a hypothetical example, right? Now that person says, um, I can't make a television news channel out of this because I only got three or four stories. It's not enough. I don't have size. I don't have scale. How am I going to make this watched by people who are connected to Goa, not just in Goa, but also elsewhere, right? That is where peer-to-peer -peer protocols like ours start to, start to kick in. Because what happens is, let's say you are that person who is saying that I can do three or four videos every week from Goa, or every day out of Goa, right? What we would do is we would simply license, we would just give you this entire technology, which I would just show you, you can create playlists to create your own video news channel. You add your three or four Goa stories, right? You want some national news headlines, what is happening? Those that international stories, sports stories, business stories, lifestyle stories, entertainment stories, all of those other things. We will give you 100 or 150 stories a day. Now consider the news channel that you have got. You've got your four Goa stories, you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, however many you want, international, story, international and national stories that you will add to your channel. <coughs> now, you circulate it here in Goa. Circulate it on WhatsApp. Circulated on Twitter, circulated on Instagram, circulated and put it on your own website. Now somebody in Goa, if they're clicking on that and watching it, are getting their Goa news and they're getting national news and they're getting international news and they're getting all of that and your opinions, this can be a channel that people here will watch. Why do you need to watch a daily based channel? That's why I'm saying peer to peer networks in this business will fundamentally disrupt. Yeah. Well, nobody would have believed if I had told you, if I had told you 10 years ago, I'm just saying if I told you 10 years ago that you're going to go into a brand new city which you've never been to and you're going to go into some stranger's house and you're going to stay there, you wouldn't have believed that that was going to be even possible, right? If somebody had told you you're going to drive, you're going to walk into a new city and you're going to, a random stranger is going to drive up to you in a car and you're going to climb into that car and that stranger is going to drop you wherever you need to go. Who would have believed it? So with technology, these things which you think are impossible suddenly become possible. What, what we actually means that, that the percentage of people who are wanting this is quite high now. Exactly. If people want this, I might as well say that because we are tired of making sense of it. We are doing that anyway. We watch all the channels to actually make an opinion as to what is going on in the industry through. It's tiring. So that's why you get the facts and, and then you have... Us something which kind of brings us so therefore if you have the facts and you are seeing a newscast with basic facts, we kind of go in for you know, this information. That's probably the direction which we need to go. are easy to see where they are biased. One can see which way you want to look at. No, it's a great thing. Watching television news channels is injurious to your head. It's bad for you. Hi, my name is Karina. Uh, two questions. Sorry if you answered this in a slightly different way. But uh, if wherever you are going, people are saying that TV is unwatchable, how come some entrepreneur has not seen that there is a sizable market for better quality news and how come this market is not getting catered through, through market forces, you know? Or you think that's happening at this point? And the second question is, uh, of late, uh, just factual news is not very satisfying. I like to explain kind of a, like an economist article. I don't mind if I read even a few days later. But I like the insight and depth rather than just factual news when I wouldn't know what to do with it. So uh, do you see that as a trend and what is your uh, view or perspective on that? Well, you know, that's, it's exactly because that is a trend and that is a market opportunity that we saw that after having spent you know, 25 or 26 years in television news, I quit television news and I became an entrepreneur and I set up a, a company to specifically cater to that. And the second point which you made, absolutely correct. We are finding that some of our videos that do the best, so we are increasing the amount that we've been doing for the last year or two. Um, the only time we will deviate from those one minute stories that are the staple of, of, of our heritage, those Lego building blocks, the only time we will deviate from that 
is to do the longer form explainers because those, those two very well. So yeah, that's what you said is exactly the reason why, why I sort of quit my job and decided to become an entrepreneur. Are you happy about it? Much. <laughs> much. Uh, mainly because I don't have to watch television news. You just try and you don't know how happy to make it. Two things make me really happy. Coming to Goa and no, not watching television news. It just elevates your spirits, makes you feel younger. It's like going to a spa. Just don't do it. It's bad for you. So, so what's your current uh, entrepreneurial work that you're doing? So I um, I launched uh, and we launched Entergy in like 2017, 2018. We launched Entergy. Got initial seed funding in the same from Airtel and in the Times. So they came in and invested in the company. Then um, when the pandemic hit, see the problem with concepts like this is it will take a long time before it really takes off. You have to be prepared to be patient. So that's pretty much the level that we are at. Are you having your own housing board? Sorry? Are you having your own housing board? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vikram. And uh, well, I must inform you that I mean, two two of the speakers for Monk Sundays were arrested by the oh. government. Trista Settlewar is released today, but she's spoken oh, on this platform. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm very happy she's released. And uh, I think Anand Tail too. 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 Anand Tail Arun Tumbe also spoke here. But anyway, I think we're very thankful to you. And I must thank uh, uh, Anjuli Bhargava, who was responsible for uh, getting you here. So may I request her to give you a small gift on our behalf?